Wir freuen uns, Keith Newmeyer, CEO von First Majestic, begrüßen zu dürfen. Eine Legende im Silbermarkt. Well, it's nice uh, meeting you over Skype. Man redet viel über Manipulation des Gold- und des Silberpreises. Zumindest ist der Preis gemanagt. Sie selbst gehen einen ganz anderen Weg, sind eine Ausnahme in der Branche. Sie sagen bis hierhin und nicht weiter. Sie haben kein Silber unterhalb von 17,50 verkauft, bauen Lagerbestände auf, gehen sogar long im Futures-Markt und lassen sich das Silber liefern. Wieso folgt die Branche nicht Ihrem Beispiel? Und äh, neulich hat die Bitcoin-Gemeinde Michael Saylor von MicroStrategy gefeiert, weil er 425 Millionen an Cashbeständen als Inflationsschutz in Bitcoin angelegt hat. Wäre das auch ein Beispiel für Ihre Branche? Also in dem Fall Cash zu tauschen in Gold und Silber. Well, look, you know, we're a publicly traded company and uh, you know we have you know regulatory. Uh, we work in a very strict regulatory environment and uh, you know where I think we're you know for us to go and invest a large amount of our capital in in um, instruments like Bitcoin or even even um, metals. I think um, our institutional shareholder base and possibly even the regulators might have a bit of an issue with it. Um, you know, it's, it's ground not really walked on. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm a little bit unique in, in the fact that, you know, I do have very much a trading background. You know, I worked for the, uh, the banks back in the 80s. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't, um, um, you know, I didn't become a geologist or an engineer as many Uh, of the you know mining professionals are in the space and uh, you know I guess that has kind of kept me away from um, you know so, so, you know some some of the standard um, uh, you know concepts or ideas that much of the executives in the mining sector follow so you know I think my risk appetite is probably a little bit higher than most and uh, um, you know but also you know that trading kind of blood that goes through my veins you know when I see very strange anomalies happening in the marketplace as we've seen as we saw this year in march you know where we saw silver prices go from you know 18 dollars all the way down to 13 or even intraday it went below 13. you know i knew right away that that was an anomaly and uh it didn't make any sense for us as a company or you know or for me even personally uh to to execute any types of physical transactions at those ridiculously manipulated metal prices. And uh, so I held off for a good six weeks uh, of, uh, from selling any physical metal. Um, I would wish many of the other executives in the mining sector would do the same thing. But, you know, again, you know, I, uh, their, their risk tolerances are different than mine. And uh, that trade ended up winning or making, you know, our shareholders considerable millions of dollars um, as a result of that decision. And I've done it in the past. And, and uh, If those types of anomalous situations occur in the future, I'll do it again. Sie sind mein persönlicher Held in dieser Hinsicht. <lacht> well, thanks. First Majestics Umsätze stammen zu über 50 Prozent aus Silber. Sie sind in dieser Hinsicht eines der reinsten Unternehmen auf dem yeah. Markt. Und das ist ein schwieriges Unterfangen, denn wenn man an andere Konkurrenten, Marktbegleiter denkt, wie beispielsweise Pan American, Heckler, Fresnillo, das sind alles Unternehmen, die man mit dem Silber in Verbindung bringt. Aber man wäre überrascht, wenn man nachschaut in den Büchern. Und das sind alles Unternehmen, die weit, weit unterhalb der 50 Prozent sind, was den Umsatz vom Silber angeht. Meine Frage wäre, wie schwer ist es, über diesen 50 Prozent zu bleiben? Und ist die Reinheit des Unternehmens auch einer der Gründe, weshalb Sie bei den institutionellen Anlegern so gefragt sind, und letztendlich ihre Aktie äh, derart liquide ist. Well, there's a couple of questions there and hopefully I answer all of them because um um because I think it's an important question. The 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 purity to me is very important. You know, when when I put this company together, you know, I wanted to you know uh, have the purest silver company in the world. Uh it's very difficult to maintain. Um companies like Pan American, you know, um, are below 30% Hecla is below 20%. Uh, Coeur d'Alene, I, I think, is around 30% or thereabouts. Um, you know, we're about 60%. And it's been tough to stay over 50% because, you know, when we look at acquisitions, um, you know, there's a lot of gold, um, you know, in the mines that we, we, we've acquired over the last uh, 
a few transactions. And I like gold. Don't don't get me wrong. But uh, you know, when you're trying to stay as pure silver as possible, it's really tough. You know what? What I don't particularly like is base metals. Um, um, you know, I, I you know we've shied away from lead and zinc. Uh, you know, a lot of silver does come from you know lead and zinc operations worldwide. And uh, we did have a few uh, lead and zinc operations up and running until just uh, a year ago. Uh, we had uh, two uh, concentrate producers, the Del Toro and the La Perea silver mines, and they were producing, one was producing a lead con and the other one was producing a lead con and a zinc con, uh, of course, containing silver. But the cost of producing silver from a concentrate is much, much higher than it is from Dory bars. And we're in a very unique situation where we have three mines that are all producing silver and gold uh, in the form of dory bars, which is almost a purely refined product. It's just a bar of, looks like a bar of silver. It's about 95, 96, 97 percent pure silver. And we ship that to the refinery for for um, uh, further refining to commercial uh, grade gold and silver bars. And uh, it's, it's a good place to be. But, you know, when it comes to M&A activity, uh, we, we could turn ourselves into a gold company tomorrow. Um, you know, there's lots of gold mines out there that we could go buy. There seems to be an abundance of gold mines uh, for sale. Uh, but, you know, you show me a silver mine. They're, they're very rare animals. And First Majestic is very unique that we have quite an interesting or unique portfolio in the fact that, you know, we've got these, you know, pure silver mines or virtually pure silver mines uh, and, and uh, that is definitely unique in the business and uh, but it does pose a challenge because um, it causes um, a real challenge for M&A as I said you know we can become a gold company tomorrow but we're trying to stay a pure silver company or at least pure as possible. Sie haben die nicht produzierenden Minen angesprochen. Nicht lange ist es her, da hatten Sie sieben produzierende Minen und nun sind es lediglich lediglich drei. Mm -hmm. ähm, werden die anderen Minen je wieder in Betrieb genommen werden? Ich frage, weil ich gelesen habe, dass Sie ziemlich viel in neue Technologien in den verbliebenen drei Minen investiert haben. Und das ist auch sicherlich ein Grund, weshalb diese so kostengünstig Silber abbauen können. Ähm, ein Dollar, den man im Unternehmen ausgibt, investiert, scheint daher besser angelegt zu sein bei den drei verbliebenen Minen als in den nicht mehr produzierenden. Wird sich das in Zukunft ändern? Yeah, you know, it, it's um, it was a hard decision to make. I can tell you that for sure. You know, we we had seven producing mines in in 2017, um, three of which um, were marginal. Um, you know, back in you know 2016, 2017, you know, the silver prices or gold and silver prices weren't particularly high, and and uh, those those three mines, uh, are, or at least four, well, one was shut down for different reasons, but um, the three that were shut down due to economics. Um, there was just no money in it. Uh, you know, we we're producing concentrates at all three of them. The Legaterra mine, we we're producing a silver gold concentrate, which was uh, um, uh, too small to really um, uh, get a, you know, a reasonable deal with the smelters that that concentrate was going to. So it was a very high cost operation. It needed, you know, $20 plus silver and then, you know, well, current metal prices. It would actually do okay if, at current metal prices. Um, La Prix and Del Toro has already touched on, they were concentrate producers producing lead and zinc and lead and zinc prices have been quite low and still remain quite low. So you really need the silver and there's no gold in either Del Toro nor La Prix, it's just silver and lead and zinc. And with lead and zinc so depressed, silver is really not enough um, to, to um, turn either one of those operations into profit. Even today it would be a challenge. Uh, so, you know, for us, we have to really look at our portfolio and say, look, you know, we, you know, we have a million hours, like Le Prix and Del Toro and La Catera, we could turn on tomorrow. And each one of them would produce anywhere between a million and possibly two million ounces of silver each. If, but of course, it would take investment dollars to get them turned back on again. And, and um, but, you know, does, is it a really good use of capital? Because, you know, the, 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 you know, the few million dollars it would take to get one of those mines up and running, if we spent that same amount of money at uh, Santa Elena, for example, on exploration or development or or, or expansion uh, or San Dimas or, or La Cantata, you know, we know what that's going to have an impact. And that's why we're spending so much money on on technology right now, because our, our view is that Santa Elena 
you know, it's a six million ounce producer today, uh, 50% silver, 50% gold. Um, um, and I'm talking about equivalency basis. Um, you know, we think that could be, you know, at least 50% greater uh, uh, in size than it currently is today with the proper investment. You know, bringing a Ritanio online and possibly even in the future expanding the, the size of that mill. San Dimas is a 13 million ounce silver equivalent producer. Again, 50% silver, 50% gold. We think it can be, you know, a 17, 18 million ounce producer within the next two to three years with the right investment in technology. Um, you know, those are big wins and, and the internal rate of return on those investments is, is quite good. So, you know, we have to, as a business, measure our investment dollars and what is the internal rate of return. So, you know, I think, you know, from a to overall business perspective, it's it's likely better for us to sell some of the smaller assets to, you know, other companies that could take them on. And, and you know, a million ounce producer to them would be a big deal. But, but a million ounce producer for us is, um, it barely even moves the needle. First Majestic is derzeit der zweitgrößte Silberproduzent Mexikos. Und sie sind auch nur in Mexiko aktiv. Es hat sicherlich Vorteile, dass man so investiert ist in einem einzigen Land und so groß ist in einem Land. Ähm, sie sind im Staate Durango der größte Steuerzahler, in Durango City der größte Arbeitgeber. Sie haben tolle Zusammenarbeiten mit Universitäten. Aber birgt das nicht auch Gefahren, was äh, Diversifikation und äh, Risiko angeht? Der äh, mexikanische Staat hat sie verklagt auf eine stolze Summe von 200 Millionen Dollar. Manche meinen, er erpresst sie und das auf dünnem juristischem Eis. Ihr nächster Kauf, Ihre nächste Akquisition, wird der aus diesen Gründen, aus Diversifikation und Risikogesichtspunkten in einem anderen Land sein? Und wenn ja, wieso haben Sie dies nicht schon früher getan? Well, it's nice that you've done some research. Um, you know, it's a very, very good question. You've got obviously um some real details in your question, it's good to hear. Um, uh, look, you know, Mexico, we, we've been in business for 18 years. And, and, and I can tell you, when we put First Manchester together, or I put First Manchester together 18 years ago, um, Mexico was a different place. Uh, it was, it was uh, a lot less complicated, um, a lot friendlier. Um, you know, the cartels weren't active, to, you know, to any great degree. And you know today it's it's um, it's a difficult environment. Um, you know you've got not not only the the government that's a very socialistic government that that is somewhat anti-business and and, and uh, potentially even anti-foreign investment, which which uh, is un very unfortunate considering you know they're they're bordering the United States and then very close to Canada. So having such a large you know populous country um, with, with a government that is anti-foreign investment or at least peers on the surface is their anti-foreign investment um, is a concern. And uh, so, you know, when we're, when we're looking at M&A opportunities, um, you know, in the last you know, couple of years, we've, we've started focusing in, in places outside of Mexico. And that is new for us, um, you know, because you know, all, you're right, you know, all our investment capital, we've invested something in the order of uh, $2.4 billion in, in Mexico in, in, in an 18 year period, we've paid hundreds and hundreds of million dollars in taxes. And, uh, you know, we've built communities, we've built towns, we've built schools, we've built infrastructure, electrical, water, internet infrastructure. You know, these schools wouldn't exist without us. You know, we transport kids from, you know, outlying communities, you know, on school buses to and from their homes, to schools every single day. Uh, um, uh, you know, it's like the, the work that we've done and the benefits that we've brought to these small communities uh, within these uh, uh, areas within Mexico is, is, is pretty, I'm very proud of it. And, and uh, I think uh, it's, it, and that's really what gets me excited is, is when I go into these communities, I see the benefits that we brought. And then these, and these are long-term investments. You know, you're, you're talking about 20, 30 years of investments in a small town that changes this community. You know, it, it puts kids through university, you know, it builds long-term sustainable um, uh, businesses that, that are outside of the mining sector. Um, and, and, you know, mining can do this. And uh, it's, it's quite upsetting and quite shocking that the Mexican government, uh, the current Mexican government is so, so short-sighted and, and, and they don't see the, the benefits of uh, the mining sector's investments, um, you know, that, that uh, we're, we've been very focused on and the entire mining sector has been focused on 
throughout my career. So, you know, look, we, but, you know, we're a publicly traded company. We've got 85,000 shareholders worldwide. I think are from, from a, um, speaking for our shareholder base, I think they would love to see us invest uh, elsewhere and diversify our portfolio. And, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, it's something that we're focused on. I can't make any promises, but, um, you know, we're, we're looking to uh, all things obviously diversify. Die Rechtsstreitigkeiten mit der mexikanischen Regierung beinhalten auch ein wenig Kursfantasie für die Aktie. Wheaton hatte mal ein ähnlich gelagertes Problem und als dieses aufgelöst wurde, ging es für die Aktie 20 Prozent nach oben. Ja. In one day. Genau. Eine andere Quelle möglicher Kursfantasie ist die bestehende Short-Position in ihrem Unternehmen, was man auf den ersten Blick vielleicht nicht meinen könnte. Rick Rule erzählt gerne darüber, dass er nichts mehr liebt als eine substanzielle Short-Position in einem Unternehmen, von dem er natürlich überzeugt ist und dem, in dem er auch investiert ist. In diesem Sinne meinen Sie auch, dass die Shorts demnächst eine religiöse Erfahrung erleben werden, wie Rick Rule sich ausdrückt? <lacht> Well, look, it, it happened back in uh, 2016. You know, I, I don't know if you were watching the stock back then, but I know we have many German uh, shareholders um, that, that own the stock back in 2016 and experienced what happened. And then, uh, you know, we had silver prices go from $13 an ounce in January 2016 to almost $21 an ounce in July 2016. And the stock went, you know, somewhere, I think it was around $4 at the time. And it went up to, I think, close to $25 Canadian. Uh, and and uh, the short position started the year at, I think it was 14 million shares and it, it dropped all the way down to 4 million shares. So, you know, a lot of that short, a lot of that rally during that six month period in 2016, it was a lot of short covering and it was, it was pretty exciting to watch. And uh, today the short position is, is ridiculously high. Um, it's something in the order of 18% of the total issued outstanding shares of the company. I think it's close to, you know, I think it's over 35 million shares short now, which is a pretty big number. And, uh, uh, you know, we're the tax issue is probably one of the reasons why it's there, uh, for sure. Um, there's institutions out there that, you know, uh, shy away from, from companies, you know, like First Majestic, you know, because of the tax issue. And uh, that's their own you know, corporate governance reasons for, for doing that. It's, it's, you know, whatever. And Wheaton had the same issue as you already pointed out when, when Wheaton solved the issue with the Canadian uh, tax authorities, um, uh, their stock uh, improved quite quickly and we would expect the same. So we're, you know, we're very much working on it. I can't, again, I can't give promises on when a resolution is going to occur, but I could, I could tell people that care, uh, our shareholders included, that there's a lot of people working on this to solve this issue. Ein Grund für die Shorts, die Position glattzustellen und das Weite zu suchen, könnte der Einstieg der Legende Eric Sprott in First Majestic mm -hmm. sein. Ist das so etwas wie ein Ritterschlag? A knighting? Ja, Eric Sprott's Einstieg. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's, yeah, I, I get you, I get what you mean. Um, uh, you know, Eric and I are, are friends. Um, uh, you know, I've known Eric for, you know, many years, right from the beginning of my career. And, and, uh, we talk occasionally and, uh, you know, he's co-invested with me in a variety of different companies. Sometimes I know he's invested other times. I don't know, but, uh, we, we have, uh, invested in, in the same companies many, many times. And, uh, he's also invested in first majestic a number, a number of times, uh, when he was running the Sprott Asset Management Gold Fund before he retired, uh, First Majestic was actually um, his biggest position uh, in, in the gold fund there. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, you know, he was peppering the market, um, you know, with his investments, as you know, uh, he invested, I think, in probably every single silver stock there is, uh, you know, out there. And, and uh, cause he's an extreme bull on silver, you know, his minimum target price for silver is $90 and he's got, a high target price of $500 for silver. So, you know, it, it, if he's half right, um, we're all going to have smiles on our face. And, uh, you know, First Majestic obviously is quite a well-known company. It's really, you know, it's my opinion anyways, the kind of go-to silver stock. And it's been under a lot of pressure due to the tax issues. And I think, you know, he decided that it's undervalued and, and um, he decided to take a position which I was happy that he did. So of course we're going to let him in and um, um, he's now a significant shareholder. Sie selbst haben ein dreistelliges Kursziel für Silber, aber Sie sagen auch, dass man so mit diesem Ausblick kein Unternehmen leiten kann. 
weshalb sie auch seit 2014 ein Kostensparprogramm eingeführt haben mit einer speziellen Gruppe innerhalb des Unternehmens und sie auch eine ganze Reihe von neuen Technologien implementieren, um die Kosten zu denken, senken, wenn sie darüber etwas erzählen könnten. Und wie tief kann der Silberpreis fallen und sie immer noch profitabel bleiben aufgrund der ganzen technologischen Erneuerungen, die sie implementiert haben? Yeah, look, I am a bull on silver. I, I do believe in triple-digit silver prices. I've said it many, many times. I think I was one of the, probably the first to come up with that phrase, triple-digit silver. Um, you know, it gets talked about more these days, which is kind of nice. And uh, at least I'm not the only one out there talking about triple-digit silver. Um, you know, the reason I come up with that number is is, is pure supply-demand fundamentals. I, I, I look at the ratio. Um, you know, we're mining as an industry worldwide uh, for every one ounce of gold we're mining around eight ounces of silver so you know it should be trading at eight you know divide a gold ounce divided by eight that should be the silver price now you know uh, could it overshoot could it get down to five to one or 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 is it going to stop at 20 to one you know i don't know what the ultimate ratio is going to be but i know that 70 to 80 where it's currently been trading for the last several years with a couple of spikes up and down um, it, it is, is there because of the paper markets, you know, the, the, the paper markets are used to that ratio and, 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 um, you know, they've been used to that ratio for, you know, three decades. So, so, um, when the market's used to something, it tends to, you know, just leave it there. And so silver has been kind of caught in this ratio. And when it does break out, it's going to be quite phenomenal. And, and, uh, Uh, the market will get used to a new ratio. Uh, what that new ratio is, I think it'll be based on supply demand, you know, with uh, all the things we're doing as a human race worldwide to go green and uh, electrify the planet. Uh, the demands on the silver silver uh, supply is, is, is ex quite extraordinary. Um, you know, the, the, um, the supply demand fundamentals for the metal, I think, for silver is probably better than any metal there is, as far as I know, anyways. And uh, it's not in the headlines. It hasn't been picked up by, by Bay Street or Wall Street. You know, it kind of gets ignored. Um, you know, silver gets looked at as the poor man's gold, which is completely the wrong way of looking at silver. Um, you know, uh, gold is a currency and the granddaddy of all currencies and should be in everyone's portfolio um, as a hedge against other currencies. But silver is a strategic metal. And it should be in your portfolio for other reasons uh, and not for the reasons you'd hold gold. So um, anyways, uh, that's why I put together a silver company. So um, I'm not, I, I know you asked me a couple of other questions. You, you threw about three or four questions at me and I only answered one of them. So if you want to re-ask me something I missed. Ja, ich finde das Kostensparprogramm, das Sie seit 2014 eingeführt oh, haben, right. sehr interessant. Mit all den technischen Neuerungen, die Sie eingeführt haben, wie tief müsste der Silberpreis fallen, damit Sie nicht mehr profitabel sind? Yeah, you know, there's, it's, it's interesting, um, uh, you know, because there's other things that go up, right? So, so, you know, there's always inflation in the world. So, so it's, it's a battle against, you know, increasing commodity prices, increasing chemical costs, increasing labor costs, you know, more regulations, higher taxes. You know, you, you name it, there's, there's, there's always an embedded inflation in costs of virtually every industry on the planet. And mining is, you know, one of the most cash intensive industries there is on the planet. So uh, we always have to fight that embedded inflation through. And the only way of doing it, as far as I'm concerned, is through uh, technology. And I think that we've done a really good job in, in, in adopting technologies over the last uh, five or six years. You know, we've reduced our costs by approximately 50% over that period of time. And, uh, um, but, you know, if we hadn't done that, um, you know, who knows where the business would be? You know, I, I, I know of a variety of other companies out there that, that are still losing money at the current silver and gold price, you know, um, uh, because they didn't make um, a lot of changes. So you know, they're, they're currently being financed by the public markets. You know, they, they continually raise money you know, uh, through shareholders just to stay alive and they're producing metal at, 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 <laughs> at a loss, you know, and, and you know, I don't want to run a business like that. So, you know, we, you know, our, our job is, as, as, as uh, you know, stewards to this business is to make a profit at the end of the day and then hopefully pay a dividend. And then 
hopefully build this business. And, uh, you know, we'll continually push that. There's, there's still, um, uh, you know, the fine grinding uh, through the HIG mill use, the, the uh, new technologies in, in, um, in ore separation and, and, uh, um, and the cyanization circuits and, uh, um, you know, even some of the underground technologies, automating some of the underground um, work that is, is uh, a consistently a very expensive part of, of the uh, mining sector. We're looking at all kinds of ways. You know, a, a decade from now, you know, um, not just the mining sector, but of course, for Jessica, it's going to be a completely different company. Um, but it takes time and capital to do it. And fortunately, you know, we have higher, high, nice metal prices where we actually can now have the cash flows to bring some of these great technologies into these operations and keep driving costs down as far as we can go. And I don't know where the bottom is, but as I said, you know, there is an embedded inflation there. Um, which we're always battling. Ich finde einige technische Neuerungen, die Sie eingeführt haben, sehr bemerkenswert. Ähm, wie beispielsweise das Beispiel in Ihrer Präsentation mit der Recovery Rate, äh, der Verwertungsrate. Da beginnt der Chart bei 65 Prozent, ja. geht dann rauf bis auf 90 Prozent. Und ich habe Sie auch schon mal reden hören, dass dieser in Zukunft mhm. sogar auf 95 Prozent gehen könnte. Das ist umso bemerkenswerter, wenn man sich ähm, vergegenwärtigt, dass 65% Recovery Rate bedeutet nichts anderes, als dass 35% des Silbers einfach so verschwendet werden und yeah. auf äh, die Halde geschmissen werden. Well, just, just, just on that topic, um, uh, you know, we're, we're now, we're not quite there yet, but, um, you know, once, once all these mills are completely uh, automated and completely redesigned, you know, using all these technologies that we're, that we're currently implementing. And it's going to take a few, a few more years to finish this whole innovative plan that we started a few years ago. And, uh, um, you know, but by, let's call it 2023, um, uh, we, we hope to be finished all these um, upgrades in, in our operations. And we could actually start to go and reprocess tailings at that point. You know, because you're right, you're dead on. Because, you know, there these tailings that have been accumulated over you know, a couple of decades, you know, have good values of silver and gold sitting in them. <clears throat> and it's already been mined, just sitting on surface. So it's a matter of just putting it in the back of a truck and dumping it in, in the mill. So, you know, that's the future. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but it's uh, an exciting future that, um, you know, we're going to be experiencing. Sehr interessante Aussichten. <clears throat> Dividenden. Wird es eine Dividende geben und wäre vielleicht die Beilegung der Rechtsstreitigkeit mit der mexikanischen Regierung nicht ein guter Zeitpunkt, um meine Dividende bekannt zu geben. Und wenn Sie vielleicht noch ein paar Worte verlieren könnten zur Kooperation mit First Mining und einer möglichen Aktiendividende dort. Sure. Okay, so three questions there. So, first one. Uh, the dividend and the taxes are not related. Um, you know, we... We don't know how long it's going to take to come to a resolution with the Mexican government. You know, we, you know, we're we're quite disappointed with the fact that it's taken this long. Um, <clears throat> but um, you know, predicting when it's going to be resolved is 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 not possible. Um, I can assure people that we're working on it almost daily. Um, we were, you know, there's a lot of consultants and a lot of lawyers spending a lot of time trying to solve the issues, and we're at the highest levels of both governments. Uh, The president of Mexico and the prime minister of Canada are both aware of it, and um, and uh, they they've got their senior people trying to resolve the issue. Um, what that means, I don't know, because it's not really a corporate issue; it's more of a political issue. And when it becomes a political issue like that, it's almost out of our hands, and we we really don't have a lot of control over it. So we kind of just have to wait for this whole process to evolve, and and uh, we cross our fingers that it works in the benefit of First Majestic. But, you know, at the end of the day, look, you know, we're a pretty big company. You know, we've got, you know, we've got over $200 million in, the, in cash in the bank. Um, you know, if we ever did have a substantial hit, you know, as a result of this issue, um, you know, look, no, no one wants to pay taxes, but it, it's not going to kill the company. It's just something begrudgingly we would have to do. Um, but we're, you know, of course, we want to see the smallest numbers possible, and that's our position. When it comes to dividends, um, um, You know, I'm pushing it. Um, I, I don't run the entire board. I, mean, I, I, I am the founder and then chief executive officer of First Majestic, and I do have some influence. Um, but it does go to board uh, approval. And, uh, 
It will be coming up at our year end uh, meeting uh, for further discussion. I can't promise anything, but it's uh, something that's definitely on our radar and it's something I'd love to see happen. So uh, let's cross our fingers that, um, you know, we, we see a dividend starting next year, but I can't, um, I can't promise anything. And your third question was? First mining, eine mögliche Aktiendividende. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, First Majestic owns, um, you know, a good chunk of First Mining. I think something in the order of 15 million shares. Uh, we also have some warrants as well. Um, uh, we did talk at one time about spinning that out. Um, it hasn't really come up lately. Um, it's, it's, you know, we haven't determined what we're going to do with it. Um, we, we, we did, um, we're not going to sell it. You know, obviously it's a long-term investment and, you know, First Mining is a kind of a sister company. You know, I did find, you know, I founded First Mining and the chairman of First Mining. Um, I think it's highly undervalued, uh, You know, they've got a great portfolio of gold assets in Eastern Canada. Um, you know, the market, you know, in some cases, they're unpermitted. You know, they're, they're, they're developed assets that need permitting. So, you know, from, you know, the market tends to, you know, not like assets that are in the permitting stage because there's risks, you know, that maybe the, the company doesn't get a permit. Uh, I think Ontario is a low risk jurisdiction. I think the projects that First Mining has in their portfolio will be permitted. But, you know, there's risks always, and that's why the stock is trading at 50 cents. If, if, if you know, if, if it was permitted, you know, that stock could be obviously a lot higher than where it's currently trading. Um, so, you know, whether we pay out a dividend or not, or, or pay out shares or not, I can't say at this time, you know, but it, it is on the, on the table. Um, you know, but, you know, look, look, you know, First Mining itself, There's a pretty interesting, they're talking about dividending out, you know, some of their shares that they've received on, you know, a couple of their transactions. So, you know, watch for what First Mining does, because I think there's some pretty interesting things happening there. Wechseln wir zum Silbermarkt selbst. Sie haben die Ratios schon angesprochen. Viele reden über das Gold-Silber-Verhältnis und manche meinen, dass es bedeutungslos sei. Sie selbst mm -hmm. sind ganz anderer Meinung. Und Sie kombinieren das Ganze mit dem äh, Mining Ratio, mit dem Förderverhältnis von 1 zu 8. Also pro geförderte Unze Gold werden 8 Unzen Silber gefördert. Und das Ganze kombiniert mit dem Gold- und Silberverhältnis, was Sie dann Trading Ratio nennen, ja. äh, ergibt eine ganz neue Perspektive. Ich finde das äh, sehr interessant. Ja, I don't know why people don't think it's relevant. Um You know, I, you know, ultimately, you know, shouldn't markets work, right? You know, because, you know, I, you know, markets do go, do go through periods of imperfection for sure. You know, Tesla running to $2,000 a share, you know, that's imperfection, right? You know, it, it's, it's anomalous. It's, an, you know, um, you know, you know, five years from now, you know, we'll be looking back and saying, wow, you know. That was pretty interesting. Just like we look at the dot, dot com bubble back in 1999 and 2000, and look what happened then. You know, the, the Nasdaq hit 5,000 in in March of 2000, and it didn't, and it went, it had an 80% correction over the next three years, and 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 stayed there until and, and until uh, 2012 or 2013, and it wasn't until 2015. 15 years later that it hit 5,000 again. So it took 15 years for the NASDAQ to hit its old high, you know, and we're going to see the same thing happen all over the game. But of course, you know, when you're in the bubble, you know, when you see Apple and, 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 uh, um, you know, Tesla, you know, doing what it's doing, people accept it, but that's anomalous in my view. Right. And as is the silver ratio, it's, 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 it's not normal, right. It's an anomaly created by, the markets, which are falsely uh, priced, right? And, 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 uh, and they could last for a decade, right? You don't know, it could last for two decades. Yeah, no, we're, we've already had a ratio of, uh, of, of, of this similar level for three decades, right? So, so, you know, as I said earlier in the interview, eventually when it changes, it just changes. And, and, and uh, you can't predict when it's going to happen. You know, I, I think it's going to be the next couple of years. And, and uh, you know, when that ratio breaks, 
to its more natural ratio, it may never get to eight. You know, Eric Sprott thinks it's going to go down to five. Um, it, it might it might not stay there, but you know, it'll it'll ultimately peak at, at five to one. Um, but it, it you know, but it'll settle out at whatever new ratio, which is a natural ratio. And it'll be ten or fifteen or twenty or whatever that number is. And and you you pick your gold price. Doesn't really matter three thousand, two thousand, five thousand dollar gold, whatever it, 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 you, you care to pick, and then do your math and come up with your silver price. I think that's where we're going to be, and I think it's going to be sooner rather than later. Sie reden auch gerne darüber, dass Silber ein strategisches Metall sei. Und sollten Sie recht behalten, dann wäre das sicherlich ein Katalysator für ein gänzlich anderes mm -hmm. Preisniveau. Für Sie ist demnach Silber nicht nur ein industrieller Rohstoff und ein Edelmetall sondern, wie Sie sagen, ein strategisches Metall. Wann hat sich die Sichtweise geändert? Waren Sie Ihrer Zeit sehr voraus? Oh, way ahead of the curve. I, 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 I came up with the phrase strategic metal, you know, probably over a decade ago. I actually don't even remember when I came up with it. I just thought of it one day. Um, uh, you know, I came from a copper company. So I guess, you know, uh, again, one of my unusual, you know, things about me is, is I, I'm, I'm a big believer in supply demand fundamentals and that's why I'm a big believer in the ratio. So I look at, and so I came from a copper company. I know how critical copper is to the world's, you know, engine of, 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 uh, um, of, of everything we do. And, and, and silver is as important as copper, you know, because, you know, this call wouldn't be uh, possible without copper and silver, right? You know, everything we do, you know, your lights in your home, your automobile, you know, you name it, everything that we do requires both of those two metals. So I look at copper and silver as very strategic metals. So if we're going to do all the things we need to do as a human race, electrify the planet, get off oil and gas, or at least to a, not use or not rely on oil and gas, the degree we do rely on it, um, diversify the, the electrical grid and um, do all the things we need to do. Uh, to clean up the planet, um, we're going to need a, a lot more silver and copper, of course. But um, uh, at, at, at current silver prices, we can't mine enough to, to, to supply the needs of the planet. You know, because we're, we're actually producing, if you look at the silver production, um, we've actually dropped now four consecutive years. Like what metal do you know of that we, you had four consecutive years of dropping production? And, and, uh, Uh, who knows what 2020 looked like? You know, we don't even know what the 2020 numbers look like. It, it's, it's likely going to be below 800 million ounces of silver. Uh, for the first time in five years, it's going to be below 800 million ounces. And consumption still in the billion ounce range. So, so um, uh, you know, this deficit has just been slowly taking the silver away. And it's just a small creep. And you said it yourself. Your question was, You know, is the catalyst going to be industry? Yeah, I think it's going to be. I think there's going to be a point. You know, you see lithium's getting some noise right now because Elon Musk is worried about lithium supply. You know, uh, a, a year ago, it was worried about cobalt supply, right? And cobalt, you know, doubled or tripled in price over a very small period of time because all the institutions decided to come in and front run industry because, you know, there's potential cobalt shortages. Well, you know, silver's not in the headlines yet. But there, you know, it will be one of these metals that will get picked up by the headlines saying, holy cow, you know, we can't produce these electrical cars. We can't produce laptops. We can't produce cell phones. We, you know, we can't do what we need to do. And, and where's all this silver coming from? And then, you know, then silver will double in price and triple in price. And, um, you know, maybe a hundred bucks silver, you know, uh, maybe the mining sector can start to, you know, supply more metal to the, to the industry that's going to be desperately in need of it. Sie sind bekannt für den Ausspruch, dass Preis äh, nicht das Angebot und die Nachfrage widerspiegelt, ähm, sondern das Marktsentiment. Ja. Und wenn sich das Sentiment verändert und Silber als strategisches Metall wahrgenommen wird, dann bedeutet dies ein äh, nicht unerhebliches Kurspotenzial nach oben. Ja, es ist ein super small market too. People don't actually even think about how small the market is. 800 million ounces of production for miners a year at call it, you know, 23 bucks uh, an ounce. 24 bucks an ounce, you know, what's that work out to? It's like 20 billion dollars or something, or, you know, uh, you know, around 20 billion dollars. How many times can 20 billion dollars fit into the market cap of Apple? <laughs> you know, Apple can buy the entire silver industry um, with petty cash. 
Eine kleine Erklärung bitte für naive Menschen wie mich. Ich bin bisher ausgegangen, dass Silberproduzenten wissen, wie viel Silber verbraucht, konsumiert wird. Und dass sie zum Beispiel direkt an Samsung liefern. Aber dem ist gar nicht so. Sie liefern nicht an Samsung. Und sie wissen auch gar nicht, wie viel beispielsweise Samsung Silber verbraucht. Ein durchaus undurchsichtiger, intransparenter Markt. Ja, yeah, there's three data collection services on the planet. One, one is GFMS out of London, England. Uh, one is um, Metals Focused, also out of London, England. And one is um, CPM Group out of New York. And then these three groups, um, you know, accumulate the data as best as they can. Um, but it's all nonsense. You know, they, they you know, they, they know what the miners produce because that's all public data. But but they they don't know what the refineries uh, are are uh, producing. They don't know what the smelters produce because this is highly secretive market. You know, uh, the, the the refineries, like you talk to Val Canby in, in 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 Switzerland. You know, they they won't tell you how much silver goes through their door or how much gold goes through their door. It's highly secretive information. And, uh, you know, you, you ask Toyota or, or, or Tesla or, 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 you know, Samsung, how much silver do you consume or copper or gold do you consume in a year for your electronics? And they're absolutely paranoid to tell you because they're worried that, you know, the, the, the second that the industries, the hedge funds out there actually see how tight this market is, how, how, um, you know, uh, that all these institutions are going to just jump in and front run them and drive drive these metal prices up to you know levels you know much much higher than where they're currently trading like what happened in cobalt you know palladium uh, uh, and, and so on so they they keep it secret so there's a lot of guessing work so you know when we talk about the consumption we we believe that the consumption is round a billion ounces a year That's based on these three data collection services that come up with these numbers. And it's totally guesswork, you know, because Samsung's not telling them, you know, they do their calculations. They try to figure out how many cell phones are sold in the world and they figure out and they do the math. They try to figure it out the best they can. But it's all highly, you know, speculative uh, data. And then, then on the supply side, they have a better understanding of the supply side. But there's, uh, on, on, but I would argue that the consumption side is uh, very much understated. Wenn Sie mögen, vielleicht können Sie ein paar Weisheiten mit uns teilen, was das Investieren in Edelmetallaktien angeht. Ich nehme an, Sie sind selbst mhm. in eine Vielzahl von Unternehmen investiert. Was wären so Ihre kurzen kleinen Tipps? Uh, scale in, scale out. Ich habe Sie auch mal darüber reden hören, dass man bereit sein muss, falsch zu liegen. Yeah, you know, I think um, Rick Rule said in, in an interview many years ago, and and uh, he's dead on. Um, uh, he said, when you when you decide to buy a particular stock, and this is mining stocks, of course, we're talking about, um, you know, expect to be down 50% on your first purchase. And, and, you know, that's kind of a hard thing for some people to really grasp, right? But But that's the way you have to think about these things, because... You know, it is such a highly cyclical industry and, and uh, you don't know um, where in that cycle you're buying. And, and uh, uh, you know, one day the silver price could be like yesterday. Look at yesterday. You know, we had gold down over $20 an ounce. We had silver down almost a dollar an ounce. You know, all the mining stocks are down. You know, if you had bought shares the day before, you know, you're already down 10%, you know, in, in, in some stocks that you might have bought on Monday versus the Tuesday. And if you don't have the, the wherewithal or, or, the, or the risk tolerance to be able to invest in something like that, you better just not invest in it. You go, go find something else to do with your money. But, um, you know, I, I, I like the, 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 the speculative nature of the mining sector because there's a lot of money you can make if you properly direct your capital. So the first thing that investors should be doing is looking at the management teams, uh, because there are a very small group of uh, management teams in this business um, that are that are really really good, and teams that you know rarely make mistakes. And uh, if they do make a mistake, they can fix it, uh, you know, pretty quickly. Um, uh, and uh, you know. So go, go with management teams, just, you know, do some due diligence, see if these management teams have built big companies in the past, you know, have they created wealth in the past, you know, um, you know, 
I know surprisingly, if you pick good management teams, you, you take away more than 50% of your risk. I'd even probably say 70 or 80% of your risk. Um, you know, you, unfortunately, a lot of people get caught up in hype and, you know, they run into a good promoter and uh, they fall into a, love into a story. And, that, and, they, and the management team might have, you know, the, you know, the best, um, um, uh, you know, uh, initiative or, you know, or, or the best, you know, thoughts try to create, create, you know, a business, but they just don't have the experience. So, you know, uh, and then they unfortunately might not have the success that, that you're buying into. So, you know, first look at, you know, I can't stress enough the management team is what I'm trying to get to. So the other, you know, the assets, of course, jurisdiction, you know, if you don't like Venezuela, or if you don't like China, or if you don't like Russia, you know, don't invest in a company that's invested in those countries. Um, you know, uh, um, it's, it's, that's pretty standard as far as I'm concerned. And then, um, yeah, I guess that, that, that's really it. So, so when it comes, so once you've decided on that, then, you know, lo look at the stock and watch it for a while, you know, watch it for a week or so and see how it trades. And, um, you know, some of these stocks never trade. Uh, so, if, you know, if you buy, you know, 10 or 20,000 shares or something like that, it might take you a week to do it, you know, because it, they're, because they're very illiquid, but don't forget if it's going to take you a week or two to buy 10,000 shares, it's going to take you a week or two to sell 10,000 shares or whatever the number is, 100,000 shares, whatever you decide to buy. So think, think of liquidity first. And uh, um, usually the better management teams have stocks that are more liquid. You know, like you look at First Majestic or First Mining, you know, those stocks trade millions of shares a day. So, so if, you know, you want to buy 50,000 shares, you know, you can sell it the next day and have no issue at all. Um, um, uh, so you have to be careful about liquidity. And, uh, um, and uh, you know, dead on right, you know, if, if you have, you know, depending on your listeners, but if you have $10,000 to invest, I, I would personally break that up into at least, you know, three to five separate transactions over a period of probably a month. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, every pick a day, every Tuesday, I'm going to buy 20% of my position and do it for four, you know, four weeks in a row and to get your position. And I, I do that a lot. I'll go in and buy a chunk first and I'll sit back and watch. And if it started, you know, if I see other buying coming in, I might jump, jump in because um, there's momentum coming in. But often, you know, uh, it's not that way. Often, you know, you'll make your first purchase and next thing you know, the stock's down five cents a week later and you, your second purchase is, you know, 10 or 20 percent below your first purchase, which is great, right? Because at the end of the day, you're going to have, you know, once you're finished your purchasing, you're going to have a great overall average. So when the stock does finally turn around, you're going to be up 100 percent on your money, you know, very quickly. And it can happen on a dime uh, for the right stocks. And that's why, you know, mining, investing in mining stocks are so exciting sometimes. I hope that wasn't too long of an answer. Nein, nein, <laughs> überhaupt nicht. Ich danke Ihnen für Ihre Zeit. Ich hätte noch zig Fragen stellen können, aber ich, ich bin Ihnen sehr, sehr dankbar. Okay. Yeah, I think the biggest lesson is just, um, you know, be prepared. Right. Be, be prepared to be wrong. But you got to stick with it. Like, you know, you, you know I, I, have, I have mining stocks in my portfolio that I've owned for over five years. That, and, and, and I ask my, the, the, you ask yourself this, this question, I bought it five years ago and today would I buy it? And if the answer is no, something fundamentals changed, right? So what's changed? And you got to ask yourself the question, maybe the, maybe the, the manager or the CEO that, that you bought it five years ago has resigned and he's no longer there. So maybe the whole management team is different and they're going on a different path, which you don't agree with. So because you're not a buyer anymore, you have two other choices. You either sell it or you hold it. And you have to ask yourself that question. So you got to go through your portfolio on a regular basis. Will I buy more, sell, or will I hold? You do that to your entire portfolio. And um, it's amazing what, what you come up with. And sometimes you'll buy a stock at, 30, 40, 50 cents a share. And then, then, you know, two, three years later, something fundamentally changes and you end up selling it at five cents and taking a big loss. But, but you have to do it sometimes, you know, fortunately, hopefully you have more winners than, than losers.
Und wie gesagt, vielen Dank für die Zeit, die Sie sich genommen haben. Es war mir ein Vergnügen. Ich bin uh, Ihnen sehr dankbar. Okay, well, thanks for your time and uh, I look forward to the interview or, or look forward to the recording. <laughs>